everyone. Good to be in the house of God with you. Ladies, if you'll have a seat. And gentlemen, if you'd like to pray, you can come forward and we'll have prayer together. Brother Chuck and Brother Jeff Mize are going to lead us in prayer. I'm so glad you're here tonight. Looking forward to the passage of scripture we have. Brother Chuck, if you'll lead us in prayer. Father, we just come to you tonight, Lord. Just want to praise you and thank you, Lord, for being so good to us. We thank you, Father, that you are gracious, gracious and you're merciful, Lord. Uh, constantly, always. Thank you for our salvation tonight. Thank you for blessing vision. Have your hand on us. May we glorify you tonight as we go into this service, and we just praise you and thank you. Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we just thank you for being the gracious, merciful God that you are. And Lord, uh, we just get to teach others about you and, and, and love on you as you love on us, and your mercies are renewed every day toward us, God. And thank you for salvation in that while we were yet sinners, God, you loved us. Christ died for us. Lord, you've risen again. You're coming again soon. We just thank you for these blessings. Lord, we're excited about tonight, things that you're going to do, things that you've already done, how you've blessed this church, and how you continue to bless. Lord, I, I just lift up if there's someone here tonight, Lord, that's in this building that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, that tonight would be that night. We just thank you for all you've done, all you're going to do in Christ's name. All right, let's all stand together and shake hands. Make everybody welcome. Good to see you tonight. Teenagers, if you'll come on up. Camp people, anybody with the camp? All right, if you'll make your way back to your seat. Thank you so much for being here tonight. The teenagers are not going to be in the service with us. They're leaving here. After they give a word of testimony and they're headed over to the Spanish church, if I understood correctly. And then from there, they're going to a, a, a separate meeting uh, that they'll have in their room tonight. Uh, at the end of the testimonies or whatever Brother Trent has in mind here, our preacher for the evening, I think, is uh, Mr. Greg. You can preach right after that. All right, we have just a few testimonies from the teenagers. Um, here, teenagers would like to say thank you for your support, helping the camp. Let's say thank you on the count of three. One, two, three. Thank you. I guess I did say on three. I should have said that. All right. Well, I want to thank you before Chase comes up here and then Junior and Charlotte and then Olivia to give testimonies uh, tonight about time at camp. I, I mentioned this to the pastor, but the time with our teenagers seems so meaningful and effective because there's an environment here through the families where we can talk um, honestly about spiritual battles. And uh, these teenagers aren't learning to fake it. Uh, they, they talk openly about uh, what they're thinking, what's going on. And that feels so great. It feels like we're really investing our lives well because of the fact that they talk about what they're reading, what they're studying, what they're struggling. And I just want to say thank you, parents, to, uh, to, for being like that and modeling authentic Christianity before your kids and not teaching them just to parrot the things that the youth pastor wants them to hear, but being honest about what they have to say. All right, Chase, you'll go first, and it will be wonderful. I'm certain of it. Hey guys, camp was great. Yep. Um, I just wanted to thank personally my parents and Amy and Uncle Mark. Yeah, I said it. Anyway, thank you for camp, uh, paying for my way to there. It's pretty awesome. Um, also, thank you to everybody else who uh, gave donations to the people who didn't have enough money. I just, I know that it really encouraged me because, I mean, my best friend, well, one of my best friends signed the pledge to be a missionary, so that was real encouragement. 
Um, also, sorry, I'm really nervous. Um, <laughs> whew, anyway. <laughs> Uh, yeah, camp was great. I, one of the favorite things that, well, obviously services were the best, especially pastors preaching. Uh, but what I really got out of it was uh, he told us that you won't start tomorrow. And I know that whenever I've been witnessing, uh, like at work and stuff, I've always thought, oh, tomorrow won't be a better time. It's not as busy. But that helped me to realize I need to do it then and there. They're dying and going to hell. So... Thank you, Pastor. All right. <laughs> uh, I just want to say thank you, and I want to say thank you to Trent for inviting me for last second. I didn't want to come, to be honest, because I was tired from a previous camp I went to, and I was exhausted, but I'm really glad I went because I made a new friend, John, this kid in the blue, <laughs> and I met some other people. I just wanted to thank you for the people who sponsored the kids who could go that couldn't pay for it fully, and thank you. Um, I'm Charlotte Penrod, and I uh, just want to say thank you to my parents for letting me go. And while I was there, the Lord really burned my heart about missions, and so I signed the pledge. And um, it was just a really good week, and really thankful that I got to go. I'm the dork who wrote it down before I came up here. <laughs> <laughs> but this is my third year um, attending camp and going into it, coming from a church like Vision, it's easy to become kind of calloused towards it. Like, this is missions, this is church, I've done this, I've made um, decisions there, I've signed the pledge. Um, so I just really started praying that the Lord would do a big work in my heart um, because it's easy and I never want to be calloused, I never want to be hard towards something like that. Um, so I started praying big prayers, mostly that um, God would lay a huge burden on my heart and for um, the people around me, um, and also that for people I know to be saved and for people I know to surrender to missions. And um, God answered all those prayers in a huge way. He was evident at that camp. Um, it's such an encouragement to be around people like that and where um, I can feel comfortable talking about the struggles like Trent was talking about. Um, but it's just a reminder of the great God we serve um, and that he's still alive and he's powerful and he's working even when my heart isn't in it, and he's constant, and so that's it. Uh, camp was great. This was my fourth or fifth year going to camp, and uh, like Olivia said, it's really easy to become apathetic towards camp and the whole concept of it, because we go to vision, and we're exposed to mission so much, but uh, right before camp, I went there with a prayer request. Uh, me and Justin sat down to talk about it. We wanted to see one person saved and one person committed to mission that we were actually able to sit down and talk to. Well, Justice got to see someone saved, and I had the chance to sit down with probably 13 or 14 people and just share my heart for missions and uh, why, why the world needs it, and I was encouraged by it, too. It's really easy to hit uh, Christian complacency, but camp always seems to fix that problem, and so it was just uh, one of the best camps so far. All right, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn them to Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus just been on the Sermon on the Mount. He uh, just came down the uh, chapter before. He's now, he's now off the sermon. This is, that's over. Well, anyway, how many of you in your lives hit a place where you say, it's really nice to feel comfortable? It's really nice to, uh, to be where life is easy. It's really nice to be where life is ordinary, where life is familiar. It's really easy to be where I feel best at. Well, anyway... Jesus, he has, a, he has a solution for that. In verse, uh, verse 19 of Matthew 8, it says, And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whither, whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me, that I may go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him, and when he was entered in and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, and so much that the ship was covered with waves, but he was asleep. And the disciples came unto him and awoke him, and saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, O ye fearful, O ye of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even so, that even the winds and the sea obey him? So there's, a, there's some very simple truth here. 
And the first one's going to be, serving Jesus can be scary and it can require sacrifice. Serving Jesus cannot always be the most, seem like the most fun thing and the most easy thing, but it, it's, a, it's a blast. There are going to be times where we're uncomfortable serving Jesus, whether it be talking to someone, whether it be putting money in the offering plate, whether, whether it be putting ourselves down and putting up, putting up someone else higher than us, whether it be loving someone who, who doesn't necessarily like us too much, whether it be being nice to someone who's been mean to us, there's going to be times where serving Jesus is uncomfortable and isn't, the most, isn't the, always the most fun thing to do. If you look uh, earlier in the Bible, when Abraham was called, you remember? He says, Abraham, I know you're 75. I want you to leave where you're comfortable. I want you to leave where you've been your whole life. He's like, follow me. If you look at where Moses was called, he spent 40 years somewhere, and God's like, all right, I want you to go do this now, Moses. It's, it's, always, it's always not the most fun thing to do, but God always blesses. And he's going to provide. When uh, we serve the God of heaven in Matthew 6, a couple chapters back, towards the end of the chapter, Jesus is saying, he's like, if I can take care of the lilies, and if I can take care of the birds, if I can take care of nature, he's like, surely I can take care of my children. Surely I can take care of those who are serving me. Surely I can take care of those I love. And it's so, so, sometimes it's so scary to step out, step out on that step of faith. But God's going to take care of his children. We're God's children. He saved us. If God didn't think enough to give us his son for our sins, do you really not think he's going to provide for us when we're serving him? He rebuked the storm. If you notice, when he got on the boat, he was on, they were on the boat and they were riding, and they had the God of the universe next to him, and a storm comes up. And Jesus had the power of everything. You remember? He, they, they said, what manner, of man is, what manner of man is this? Well, Jesus was no man. Jesus is no man. He's God. Philippians 2 says he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, that he was God. He came down to this earth. Jesus was God, and he proved it right there when he said, hey, storm, go, leave. He rebuked the storm. He told a storm to go away, and it went away. It rained the last day of camp, and uh, I was like, man, I want to get outside. So and I looked out the window, and I went, storm, please go away. And guess what? The storm didn't go away. No matter how much I wanted it to, that storm stayed there. Jesus rebuked the storm. We serve the God of heaven. Now we're going to be like the disciples in the boat and be like those little faith. They were on a boat with Jesus. They were on a boat with God. And they said, oh boy, we don't know what to do. They doubted when God was right next to them. They doubted when they had the God of the universe right next to them. He said, oh ye of little faith. We have the Holy Spirit with us. And are we too scared when life gets a little wavy to ride it out? We have the God of the universe inside us. John 16 says that we have the comfort in us. Sometimes we doubt the power of God. But we, we forget. We have, we have God in us. We have God around us. God loves us. So when, when we uh, need to step out on faith and when life gets a little uncomfortable, just trust God because he can rebuke a storm. He's powerful. He created this world. And there's surely nothing he won't do for us. Thank you. All right, let me uh, ask the World Evangelism Cabinet to come up here, all of you that are here. It's in the World Evangelism Cabinet. And uh, youth workers. I don't know if Trent's here. Brother John's a youth worker. Greg, come back up. Greg's leaving to go to Nepal. Uh, well, he's, yeah, he's going to Nepal. No, he's going to India. And then from India, he's going to Nepal. That's how that went. And so I just wanted us to have a word of prayer for him. Uh, and I think he's probably leaving to go with the rest of the young people. Who's in charge of India around here? Brett's not here. All right. Well, that means John says, uh, you're a Sunday school teacher, Correct. Okay, we'll get a microphone over here for Brother John, and uh, we'll just put us a substitute in there. He doesn't have one. He's got one. All right, we'll put a substitute in there. Lamar, he's your boy. We'll have you pray, and uh, you, want, you want to be the other prayer? You can pray as though you were his director. All right, do you, do you know Greg? Not really. Who knows Greg? <laughs> if you don't know him, it'd be best to... All right, Dan knows... Oh, no. No, Dan, don't pray. Don't. <laughs> They don't tell what Dan's going to pray, but I uh, want you to pray for Greg. He's a fine young man. I love him. I've watched him grow up for a long time, and I am extremely excited for him as he gets to go to India. I think he's going to be gone six weeks, correct? 30 days. 30 days. Okay. Not, that'd be 42 days. That must be four weeks. Anyway, he's gone for a long time. He told me, I don't think I'm coming back to vision for a while, and so... Anyway, uh, let's have a word of prayer for him. John, if you'll start, and then Dan, and then Lamar, you can close us in prayer. And let's ask God, you may want to gather around Greg there and lay your hands on him for me, and let's pray and let him know we love him as a church. I'm very proud of him and excited for this to happen. Did y'all get the order? So John, Dan, Lamar. John.
Father, we thank you for Greg, and uh, we just ask that um, during this time period of um, many decisions and uh, many experiences that you would speak to his heart, um, expose him to uh, your joy and your direction, and Father, we just ask that this would be a time where uh, he learns a lot about himself and more about you, and uh, we just ask that um, every, uh, everything that he's going to be doing um, would be to glorify you and to encourage this young man uh, as, as you equip him and teach him and expose him to the things uh, that would be your work. Father, we love you. In your name we pray. Dear God, Lord, as his, as his uh, earthly dad, Lord, I thank you for a son that, and the young man that he's becoming, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the heart that he has, Lord, to go to different countries, Lord, even at his young age, Lord, and willingness to step out, step out on faith and share, share the gospel, Lord. Lord, we thank you to, to allowing us as a church, Lord, to send him and uh, making a way for him to be sent. And, Lord, we know he's going to be a blessing to anyone he comes in contact with, Lord. Lord, we just thank you, and we ask for uh, travel and mercies to go over there safe, Lord, and uh, keep them safe on there over there in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Y'all give a hug and a handshake. If you love Greg and you'll pray for him, I'll about a round of applause for him. And uh, I, I do thank the Lord for Greg. He's a very unusual young man. And uh, I think Dan Penrod is our world evangelism man. And then after that, Brother Steve, I know I messed everything up, but we'll live. All right, go ahead and uh, hit the first slide. Okay, this is a country overview for uh, the country and continent of Australia. Of course, it's the only country that is its own continent, uh, which means it's a huge landmass. Um, I think it's 23 million square miles. Um, and what's, what's crazy about that is um, it's not very populated. If you look at this uh, population, it's going to be hard to see, but um, the red dots that you see uh, all along the coast, those are the major cities, and that's over 90% of the population is made up there. So um, it's very much a coastal nation. And um, a little bit of history and background um, on Australia it was actually being used, uh, well, let's go way back, uh, over 250 different indigenous tribes um, that uh, are also known as aborigines um, populated uh, the continent until about 19, or I'm sorry, until about 1787. 1787, uh, the British had just been rejected. They sent a, a fleet of ships full of their lowliest, worst prisoners. Uh, to the U.S. and the U.S. said, no, we are independent from you. We don't accept your prisoners anymore. Uh, they went back, and then about 10 years later, they dumped them all in Australia and created a penal colony. So that's how the British actually started colonizing uh, Australia. Um, fast forward over time, um, the six large areas, those are, uh, those are also known as, um, as colonies. Uh, there's actually seven with uh, Tasmania down at the bottom. Um, those unified uh, in 1901, the, uh, the I got to get the, <coughs> excuse me, the official title. Australia was uh, established as a dominion of the British Empire, which means they own the land and all the resources and pretty much their law dictates what goes on there. Because of that, um, the settlement really began, um, and uh, it was one part British and, and one part uh, South Wales. Um, some of you will know the distinction on that. And uh, the eastern side was the British side, and that's where all the big cities are. So, so that's where all the action is, is, is on that eastern coastal side. Um, because they were settled largely by the British, the Church of England is, it dominates and has uh, for hundreds of years there. There's a huge shift that's taking place, though. One, the country is growing, and although it's not very populated, um, with uh, just over 20 million people, um, it's, it's growing rapidly, and it could grow rapidly for a long time. It's that big. But what is happening is, if you want to go to the next slide, is that top line, the purple line, is uh, people who identify as, um, a, a, as a Christian affiliation, and that includes the Church of England, Anglican Church, uh, Catholic Church, okay? That's not what we would necessarily identify as, as Christian, um, but is a, it is a largely Christian-identified nation. The problem is, is um, do they really know Christ? The other problem is the top line is going down. 
So that is just from 2009 until uh, 2013. And it's gone from like 65% of people identifying as Christians down to 52% in a matter of four years. The bottom line is people who, who don't identify as Christian. And that's the, that's the, the issue, and that's uh, what we need to pray for, where we, we need God to work, is uh, we need missionaries, we need people to be sent, um, because if this trend continues, those lines are going to intersect. And when those lines intersect, all of a sudden, the Christian church doesn't have as much influence as it does today. So now's the time to do it before you lose control. The top three um, uh, religions are... Uh, I'm sorry, growing religions are Hinduism, Sikhism, and Islam. And in the bottom three uh, are included in uh, Church of Christ, Baptist, and uh, Methodism. So Christians are continuing to have less and less influence. And this is kind of a, almost a forgotten area because it is so big in terms of, uh, you know, sending missionaries. It is such a, l a large landmass. Um, it's very spread out. It takes very long to get there from the Western world. And um, we just need to be praying that God would raise up leaders, that we would do our work, not just praying about it, but uh, we would get people involved um, that would have a heart for this and be open to it because there, there is a battle and the battle's going around, uh, you know, is going on around the entire world. But this is a, a perfect example of what we're up against um, because people are, are really rejecting Christianity like, like never. And uh, so this is our challenge. Uh, be in prayer for the country of, of Australia. And if you want any more information, come ask me. I won't know it, but I'll help you find it. Thank you. Let's have the men come forward for the offering. I'll pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love, Lord. We thank you for being Jehovah Jireh, our provider. We thank you for caring for us. Pray that we'll acknowledge you in our king in every aspect of our lives, Lord, in our love, in our time, in our giving. Pray that you'll bless this offering. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, I am uh, reading you the prayer letter of David and Katie Gardner. If you don't know David and Katie Gardner, of course, the children of Brother Austin and Miss Betty Gardner. And uh, if I were to describe David, I would describe him as 100% missionary. He is fully living out uh, being a missionary. Katie is a, a wonderful person, full of grace, just kind of uh, riding above the waves of life and just kind of keeping things smooth. Uh, Chloe is a charmer of a little girl, so <clears throat> I don't really like to play games. I don't like to, uh, I don't like girly things, <clears throat> but we're playing the fingernail game at my house, <clears throat> which is embarrassing, but it was fun. Uh, Allie will turn your house into a gym, uh, and she is not, she's not safe. She's a little David. Uh, she is going to do backflips, and, and uh, she's going to do things that are going to make you very uncomfortable, and, uh, and she's going to have great, she loves that, she's going to have great fun with that, and uh, James, if you are what you eat, then James is a banana, so he, the boy, the boy eats a lot of bananas, so David is a great missionary, he's doing a great job, and I was very proud of David for sending out an update uh, on the missionary, mission work in Peru, <laughs> that's great, now I know that he dictated it, David won't sit down and write, but I'm sure he dictated this. All right, so uh, the Peru Bible College, God has given us a great start to the semester here in Peru. We have approximately 45 students this semester, and that is an amazing thing. I know that uh, they've, they've had some ups and downs, but things are going well. They'd certainly like to get to 50 and beyond that. And then the senior class from the Bible College is going out to start a church in a city called Kamana, a coastal city about three hours away with about 50,000 people in population. And there have been many people that have been asking someone to come start a church there. Please, please pray for Pastor Pablo Villegas and the seniors as they go out to start church services. And they've, they've done that on May 26th. <laughs> At Omega, uh, in May, they celebrated the church's seventh anniversary. And that is exciting. David writes, uh, even though the, through the struggles and changes, he has been faithful to lead us and guide us. And the church has been growing by leaps and bounds. So... It's a, a well-placed church. God did a great thing putting it there, giving somebody with uh, David's enthusiasm and passion, putting him <clears throat> across the street from a college is a, is a wonderful thing. Uh, they had a service at the park with 175 people in attendance, and you know that uh, uh, Kaysen and Bethany and David and a group of people went off to Ecuador, so David's been a big part of uh, training a lot of people. 
uh, a lot of folks coming down and learning and getting ready to go to their respective mission fields. And then for a furlough in April of um, 2018, David and Katie and the kids will be coming home. They've been in Peru for over five years. So that is exciting to have them back for a, for a period of time. They get to come back on a relatively regular basis uh, for different responsibilities that David has to raise more support and to, and to uh, take care of uh, family and friends. But this will be great to have them back for a year. Pray for, for David and Katie, so we're very, uh, Excited to be their yoke fellows. Amen. Go ahead and stand with us again. We'll continue to sing together. song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Clothed in rainbows of living color, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you the only wise king holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and is and is to come with all creation i sing praise to the king of kings you are my everything and i will adore you filled with wonder awestruck wonder at the mention of your name jesus your name is power breath in living water such a marvelous mystery holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and is and is to come with all creation i sing praise to the king of kings you are my everything and I will adore you. You can have a seat.
I'd like to invite Miss Natasha Tolson to come up here right quickly. I want you to know her and pray for her. She said, what else am I going to say? And I said, I will ask her, her some questions. I think we ought to love these people that are sacrificing and giving. I don't know if you have any idea. China's a great place to live, but it is not America. And uh, so not Natasha and Mark are doing a great job over there. And, and, and I think we're all very proud of them and Ben and Crystal are over there and other people. But has anybody got a question you'd like to ask this young lady? If not, I got to, I'll ask her three questions. Anybody got a question for her? Yes, ma'am. Why don't you just tell us about what you do with the children on Sunday mornings? Okay. Um, um, so we have a children's Bible club on um, Sunday mornings before the morning service. And so we um, it's an outreach time where we invite families in the community to um, bring their children in to study English. And um, so... During this time, we kind of run it like um, a master's club or a um, Sunday school. So we um, have the children come in and they sing some songs in English and um, we teach them a lesson and then they have different things. We give them for homework, um, memorizing some simple verses or um, the answer to a question. So a question might be, um, does God love us? And they should answer, yes, God loves us. So the question would be very simple, but it would force them to kind of use English to answer um, a question or a truth. Um, so we do this. Um, um, sorry, I'm so nervous. Um, so we started this to try to reach families in the community um, because we're having a hard time getting families to bring their kids um, to church, so we um, decided to do this before the morning service so that the families would come and they would bring their children, and then we would invite them to stay for the service after the club finished. And so we've seen um, a lot of families um, stay for the services and hear the gospel um, through this ministry. And um, we have had um, several families uh, faithfully, well, regularly attend our church. Um, who are still attending our church, um, and several of them are asking a lot of questions and are very interested in um, the Bible and learning about Jesus. Um, and it's not totally in English because we found the kids didn't understand, obviously, and we want them to understand the story. So what we do is um, I do it in English, and then I'll kind of give them a Chinese explanation. So I'll say part of the lesson, then give them a Chinese explanation, and then continue with the lesson. So um, that's what we have going on on Sunday mornings before the service. And then um, I am involved in the music ministry in the church and help with playing the piano and the worship. And um, we also have um, monthly ladies meeting that we hold in Chinese um, for the ladies and um, just working with the ladies who um, whose husbands have recently surrendered um, to the ministry, just working with them on Friday nights, um, inviting them in our home and cooking meals with them. And so that's what um, I'm currently doing. Oh, okay, I'm going to preach a little bit, but go ahead. <laughs> I guess the threat would be to be kicked out. Um, so that's the threat, but um, so far we haven't had any issues at this particular location and previous issues and previous locations we had the police um, come visit a couple of times which forced us to change locations. But um, a couple of years ago, 
um, through some advice of other missionary friends in China, we moved to a business building. And since moving out of residential, moving from residential into business building, we've had less issues and haven't had any um, problems with the police um, since that time. Um, but I guess the threat would be, you know, they could come and force us to leave. Um, to some degree, yes, but um, with our, our teammate, um, the Tobbies that were in Harbin, the believers there haven't faced any severe um, persecution. They have the police kind of come regularly to their churches and, and things, um, but there's always a risk, you know, there's a risk um, of losing jobs, there's risk of uh, family persecution, we've had people, you know, people in our church whose families have disowned them and things like that. As far as the government, um, you know, I think there's risks there, but we haven't seen anything, you know, severe happen so far. I'm uh, giving this lady a round of applause, let her know she'll pray for her. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, Mark and Natasha are doing something that is unheard of. They are working with those children. Natasha does a great job. I watch her. I don't understand the uh, Chinese, but I understand the English. And uh, she's teaching the kids, and uh, she's doing a great job. I'm very proud of her, proud of her husband, proud of the fact that God's let them see people saved, lives changed, and young men into the ministry. And thank you for supporting them and giving money towards them. Please pray for them. Pray for Ben and Crystal Johnson. They're in the process of moving to Shanghai, which is another city. Uh, I think, Brett, and I just looked up 1,800 kilometers time they drive around the, the, the inlet there until they get down to Shanghai. They're going south. So that's um, about, well, straight line, about 650 miles, uh, 700 miles south. So pray for the Ben and Crystal and uh, pray for Mark and Natasha. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 6. Thank you for loving these young people. Thank you for helping them. We are in an all-out war against the devil and for the cause of our Lord and King Jesus Christ to get the gospel around the world, and I'm so glad that he's using them. Now, if you're here Thursday night, Mark Coffey and his wife will be trying to get you to buy a camp T-shirt for a donation. And uh, so Thursday night, bring some cash because uh, he's going to come after you. All right. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 18. That's just to help you, Mark. I'm getting warned up. Nobody shows up Thursday night for church, so it's all your fault. 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 18. Now, I want to read you a passage of Scripture. And obviously, for the time's sake, you won't get as much of it as I had maybe wanted you to. But I want you to just realize, as I preach through the Bible, I always say, God, what are you trying to say here? What are you doing here? And in this passage of Scripture, what's going to happen is Elisha's going to pray. And God's going to answer. And the story is going to be pretty wild. You're going to hear the story and you're going to be like, well, that's crazy, man. Look how Elisha could pray and how God would answer prayer. And wouldn't it be neat if God would do that for us? But the Bible says he does and will. And we do have a God who hears and answers prayer. And I'm going to try to get as much of that to you as I can. But I want you to read the story just because I think it helps you realize how confident a man of God in the Bible was when he prayed. He just had a basic assumption. I'm going to ask. He's going to do it. I'm going to ask, he's going to do it. Read with me. The Bible said, when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Hey, God, smite these people, I pray you, with blindness. Look at the answer. And he smote them with blindness. He said, God, smite them with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. God just did what Elisha asked him to. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. And it came to pass when they were coming to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And we get to the Samaria part on Thursday night in the Gore Center meeting, and there'll be, uh, uh, there'll be the persecution, and then God will bring great relief to them. But I just want you to notice this right here. I, I think sometimes we have kind of gotten to the place where maybe prayer doesn't seem to be so real and so big, and yet in the Bible it's just assumed that you would believe it. I want you to go back with me to verse 18. I wish you'd underline in your Bible, Elisha prayed, and he says, smite, and the Lord smote. 
You ought to underline it. He said, smite, and the Lord smote. And then in verse 20, he said, hey, Lord, open the eyes. And the Lord opened their eyes. Dr. Lewis, Will, uh, Will, uh, Walter Wilson said, why pray when you can worry? Asking God and expecting an answer was exactly the lifestyle we see in Elisha. I'm going to show you several things here tonight. God, asking was just unashamedly the way it was done. God wants us to pray. God has promised to answer prayer. What is it then that hinders our prayers? And let's not fall into the trap of being prayerless. Father, I pray now that you take these next 15, 20 minutes and help us to see quickly from your word that you are a God that answers prayer. I pray you'd show your power. I pray you'd move in your people's lives. I pray you'd motivate them and encourage them that they can ask you and that you will hear and answer. And God, help us to become more of a praying people. In Jesus' name, amen. First thing I wish you'd write down somewhere is that unashamedly Elisha prays and asks God for things. Elisha knows that we ought to know that God hears and answers prayer. Look at Psalm 65 too, right quick. I'm going to have to just skip through most of the verses and skip them. But look at this. God is, O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. That's a description. So the psalmist says, God, you're the one that hears prayer. And since you're the one that hears prayer, everybody in the world will come to you. Idols don't hear prayer. Idols don't answer prayer. But God is big enough and strong enough and powerful enough to answer prayer. And so we could spend a lot of time on that verse. I really wish you'd memorize that verse and think about it. O oh, you that hears prayer. O oh, God that hears prayer. Everybody will come to you. You see, God wants us to pray. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Look at this. You know what praying is? Praying is believing God. You know what praying is? Praying is going to God and actually believing he's going to do it. When Elisha said, hey, God, uh, close your eyes. God, uh, Elisha was, expect, he was fully expecting that God would hear him and answer him and that God was that big. So he went to God believing that God was. He went to believe, God believing that God would hear him. He went to God believing that God would reward him and God did. Did you know God doesn't do a lot of things with us because we just don't believe him anymore? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 58, he said that he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. In other words, their unbelief hindered God from doing the work. You're not going to believe this verse, but it's in the Bible. Mark it down, look it up and let your own. The Bible says in Mark chapter 6 and verse 5, he could there do no mighty works. Look at that verse. It's right behind me. He could there no, do no mighty works. Say that he lay hands upon a few sick folk and healed them, and he marveled. Because they're unbelievable. He couldn't even understand how they couldn't believe him. He couldn't even understand how they couldn't believe him. Our God wants us to unashamedly come to him in prayer and ask him for things. Our praying would be a sign we really believed God and believed that he would do it. God wants to answer prayer so we'd be full of joy. That's what he said in John chapter 16 and verse 23. The Bible said, And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. God wants his people to have the privilege and the pleasure of asking a God that hears and answers prayer. If Elisha could do it, we ought to be able to do it. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, he said, cast all your care on him. He cares. He doesn't want you worrying. He don't want you all tore up. He doesn't want you frustrated. He don't want you feeling that way. He said, cast all your care on him. Psalm 55, 22, he said the same thing. Cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain thee. So here's what I want. Elisha just prays. I was reading that. I was Honestly, I had that in the outline already to go all the way down to the end of chapter 7. And I was just going to say in the first thing, you know, Elisha prayed and God answered. And I was praying over the message and praying for you and thinking about you. And it's like the Lord said, well, won't you tell him I hear prayer? Won't you remind them that I'm a God that likes to be prayed to? Why don't you remind them that I want them to pray to me? Why don't you show them that Elisha just said, God do it, and God did it. That's a crazy thought. I want you to know this, and this is, we're out of the passage. I'm just going to show you in the Bible. God wants us to pray. Would you write these verses down and look them up later? God wants us to pray. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 1, the Bible said, Men ought always to pray. And not to faint. Jesus was doing the talking. Men ought always to pray 
and not to faint. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, he said, I don't want you worrying, I want you praying. I don't want you worrying, I want you praying. He said, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and I'll give you peace you won't believe. God wants his people to pray. He wanted them to pray that they wouldn't enter into temptation, Matthew 26, 41. He wanted them to pray so they could get stuff. Did you know that God wants you to have stuff and he wants you to ask him for it so he can give it to you so you know he gave it to you? This is a crazy verse. You're probably not going to like it. You're probably going to think it sounds charismatic, but I'm going to read it out of the Bible. Look if you would at James chapter 4, verse 1 and verse 2, if you would. James chapter 4 and verse 1 and verse 2. See, God wants his people to pray. And honestly, there's so many verses I could have given you. Just take these. In the story, Elisha says, God smite them and he smote them. God give them open their eyes and God opened their eyes. It was like Elisha just assumed God hears prayer. Elisha just assumed that God answered prayer and he prayed that way. Look at James 4, 1. For where do wars and fightings come among you? Don't they come of your lust, of your desires, of what you want, that war in your members? you got stuff you want, and you wish you could get it. So in verse 2, you lust, you want, but you don't have it. You kill and desire to have, you can't obtain it. You fight in war, yet you have not, because you ask not. We ought to ask God. We ought to ask God. We ought to ask God to meet our financial need. We ought to ask God to give us that job. We ought to ask God to give us that baby. We ought to ask God to help us with that health issue. God's up in heaven saying, I still hear prayer and I still answer prayer. Where are the people that believe me enough to ask me? God wants us to ask him in prayer. Did you know that God has promised big answers to prayer? The Bible is so full of God saying, I am the big God that answers big prayers. Look if you would at Psalm chapter 81 and verse 10. Psalm chapter 81 and verse 10. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I'll fill it. Now, if that's not a crazy verse, here's what God said. When you pray, just go ahead and open your mouth and say big stuff. Just say big stuff. I'll do it. That's a crazy verse, isn't it? He said, open your mouth wide, and I'll fill it. Look, if you would, at Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3. I would assume you all know the verse, but look at it. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which you know not. Hey, just call on me and see if I can't answer prayer. Just call on me and see if I can't answer prayer. I heard a famous preacher say one time a long time ago, he said, when a lost man doesn't have a job and a saved man doesn't have a job, the saved man ought to have confidence that the lost man doesn't have because the lost man's got to figure out how he can get a job, and the saved man knows how he can. He just talked to God. God hears and answers prayer. God hears and answers prayer. Look at what he said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 32, he said, He spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Joe, you know God's up in heaven saying, Guys, you can't ask for anything big because I've already given you the biggest. You can't ask for anything big. I gave you Jesus. I gave you my son. And so a little, the little penances that you want to ask for are nothing. Just ask. I'll give you all things. In 2 Corinthians Chapter six, uh, Second Chronicles, chapter 16 and verse 9, God's eyes run to and fro throughout the earth looking for somebody who can show himself strong in their behalf. God wants people to pray and ask, ask. George Mueller was a great preacher, great Christian. He was a German living in, in uh, Great Britain. And George Mueller wanted everybody to know that God would hear and answer prayer. And he knew you could preach all the messages you wanted to preach, but God wouldn't, or the people might not believe that. So he set up an entire ministry to take care of orphans. And he said the real purpose in the ministry, the orphans wasn't the orphans. It was to show people I can ask God in prayer. And God will answer my prayer. He started the orphanage and he asked God, he said, I need a place. God gave him a place. He said, I need furniture. God gave him furniture. I need plates and forks and spoons. And God gave him plates and forks and spoons. And on about the day he was about ready to open it, he said, I forgot to ask God for kids. He said, I got everything, but I don't have any kids. He said, so I asked God for kids and God sent kids. God is a great prayer answering God. Here's some Bible verses for you. God wants to answer prayer and he promises to. In Matthew 7, 7, you know the verse. He says, ask and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. He that asketh, find, receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth. He that knocketh, it's open to him. He says in verse 11, in Matthew chapter 7, there in that same passage of Scripture, he said this, if you know how to give good gifts to your kids, what do you think I am? I know how to give good gifts to my kids too. Your kids are allowed to come ask. God's like, well, come ask me. I'm a good dad. 
I'm a good dad. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 22, he said, All things whatsoever you ask, shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive them. Just ask all things. In Mark chapter 11 and verse 24, he said, What things soever you desire, whatever it is you want, you pray and believe and you'll receive it. In John 14, 13, he said, Whatever, Whatsoever you'll ask in my name, I'll do it so my Father will be glorified. John 15, 7, he said, Ask what you will and it shall be done. I know none of these verses are true. They're just Bible, right? How many of you believe it's the Bible? Say amen. amen. If it's the Bible, it ought to be true. Amen. amen. First John chapter 3 and verse 22, he says, Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. This is the confidence that we have in him in 1 John 5, 14, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. For the second time, I am running like a crazy man. Not giving you the illustration, not showing you this, but I just wish you'd get a hold of something. In the story, Elisha asked and God answered. In the story, God, Elisha asked and God answered. You serve a God who wants to answer your prayers. One illustration. Years ago, I was in our, the first church that Betty and I started. I was 23 years old when I started the church, and I really messed the finances of the church up. And uh, so somebody had to lose a salary. I had me and an assistant pastor. I paid the assistant pastor the exact same thing I made. And if I'd have fired him, I could have kept my salary. We'd had it, but I decided to give up my salary. And I lived for two years without the church paying me, and I didn't have another job, and Betty didn't have another job. I just figured I could see if God would do for me what he did for George Mueller. And for two years, Betty can tell you, we ask, and God answered and worked miracles that would raise the hair on your arm if I told you all of them. It was a Sunday morning. It was a Sunday morning, and, I, and God really led me to do this. But it was a Sunday morning, and I was outside, and Betty told me we had a bill. And I went outside, and I was uh, sitting out in the cold on a rock, and I said, God, if you don't give me $100 a day, I can't pay my bills, and I'm going to look really bad. And I, I'm not telling anybody this not happening, but I need you to come through. And I told everybody in the church, do not ever give me money directly because I don't want to be thanking you for money. I want to be thanking God. So put it in cash and put it in this box over here. And I walked in, and Jack Jones walked up to me and handed me a $100, $100 bill. And I said, Jack, please don't do that. I've asked you not to do that. And Jack said, all I know is at 8 o'clock this morning, I had this extremely intense pressure on me to give you $100. I said, at 8 o'clock, I was on a rock asking God for $100. God answers prayer. And why doesn't he answer our prayers? Six minutes and three pages of notes. How about this? Because we pray selfish prayers. In James chapter 4 and verse 3, he said, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. In Proverbs, first off, you know, God's not in the prayer answer business like the prosperity gospel teaches at all. God's in the prayer answer business that brings honor and glory to his name, but we can ask. The second reason God might not answer our prayer, and I just picked a handful of them, is we're selfish. When you live selfish lives, God's kind of like, I'm not going to Bless you. In Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 13, he said, Whoso stops his ears at the cry of the poor, he'll cry, but he won't be heard. You know, we get money, we get things, and God blesses us, but we're selfish and keep it. In Mark eleven twenty five, 25, we hold on to unforgiveness. And we go in and we stand praying, but we don't forgive. And God doesn't hear and God doesn't answer. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, we don't treat our wives right. This is where I would have really honed in just a second if I was, had more time. But do you realize that God's up in heaven saying, I don't like the way you treat your wives. I'm not going to answer your prayers. That's a crazy verse, isn't it? You want to know why your prayers aren't answered? Because they're hindered because you're not, treating, you're not living with her according to knowledge. God said, I don't answer your prayers because you don't believe me when you do pray. You don't believe me when you do pray. You just pray the prayers, go through the motions, but you don't really believe me. In James chapter 1 and verse 5, he said, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But you ask in faith, no doubt, no wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed, and let not that man think that he'll receive anything. Let me give you two or three more verses here, and I quit. I'm afraid we've fallen more into the sin of not praying. I'm not sure if it's a 
the fatalistic, deterministic doctrines that we've kind of accepted that God's going to do what God's going to do. We let Calvinism creep into our hearts to the point where what's the use of praying because whatever God's going to do, he's going to do, which would be very not what the scriptures are teaching us. Elisha just prayed expected God to do it. Samuel said in 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 23 that he would not quit praying. He would not sin against God by ceasing to pray for them. You and I ought to know this. Prayer has got to be a central, real part of our lives. In 1 John chapter, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, he said, praying always. Do you know, nowadays, modern Christians, ought to, we don't pray because we got doctors. We don't pray because we got lawyers. We don't pray because we got Google. We don't pray because we can figure it out. We don't pray because we know what the weather's going to do. We've seen it on the television. God wants us praying at all times. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 4, the early church knew it was so important. That's why they elected those first deacons so they'd have more time to dedicate in prayer. Wouldn't have to worry about stuff themselves. We would give ourselves continually to prayer. I think maybe we don't pray because we don't enjoy God. We talk about Him. Spend little to no time with him. He said, the people draws nigh to me with their mouth and with their lips, but their heart's far from me. We ought to seek God. We ought to seek God. It ought to be like, I know from reading my Bible, there's a God in heaven that hears and answers prayer, and he wants me to come looking for him and asking him. Wouldn't it be amazing if we asked God and he did big stuff in our lives? Wouldn't it be amazing if we saw God answer prayer? In Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11, this is what the Bible said. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. I think thoughts of peace, not evil, to give you an unexpected end. Verse 12, he said, pray unto me and I will listen to you. Pray unto me and I will listen to you. I'll hearken to you. Verse 13, he said, and when you seek me, you will find me. When you search for me with all your heart. The story is so beautiful to me. What Elisha does is just such a wonderful thing. It's amazing. I know what we think. We think he's a Bible character, and so Bible characters can do what we can't do. But in, the Bible tells us over in the New Testament that Elijah was a man of like passions like as we are. So Elisha could do it. Elijah could do it. We can do it. Well, Elisha is a man of like us. And Elisha said, God, would you make them all blind? Thank you. Boom, they're blind. And he said, all right, God, you can open their eyes now. God opened their eyes. And Elijah, Elisha didn't have any special track you don't have. He doesn't play favorites. We serve a God who hears and answers our prayers. And we can't stop praying. We need to pray for God to let us see people saved. We need to pray for God to, to help us with our financial needs. We need to, I, in my devotions this morning, I was doing a bunch of devotions this morning. While I was doing devotions this morning, one guy, one guy spent all of his money on doctors and never talked to God in prayer. You're not, you know, you and I are supposed to spend time talking to God and praying and asking God and begging God and expecting God and believing God. I think the thing that just thrills me is this. Elisha didn't even bat an eye. I read that story and it's like the craziest thing I've ever read. Elisha said, Lord, blind them. Thank you. Lord, open their eyes now. Thank you. There was um, no special incantations, no special movements, no special posture, no nothing. He just knew God heard prayer. Do we? It's time for us to pray. Father in heaven, I love you, and I thank you for the chance to serve you, and I pray you'd burden our hearts with the idea that you are a prayer-hearing, prayer-answering God. And I pray you'd motivate us to get a hold of you in prayer and to ask you and to trust you and to believe you, and I'll give you praise and honor and glory for all you do. Thank you so much. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you'll know whether or not God dealt with your heart. You'll know whether or not God spoke to you. I just ask you to tell him, Lord, I've been guilty of the sin of prayerlessness. And I'm going to begin praying. I've begun to doubt that you really hear and answer prayer, but I'm going to begin to pray and believe you. If that's your prayer, why don't you tell him that right now? Why don't you say, God, work in my life. Give him honor and glory because he's a God that hears and answers prayer. Father, I love you. I thank you for the chance to serve you. And I pray that your name will be glorified. And we'll give you praise for it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, thank you very much. You can look this way. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, next Sunday is tailgate Sunday. We need 11, I think it was 11 more tailgates. So if you could help by bringing something and preparing some food and doing some special stuff, 
uh, Sunday we'll be outside. The tailgates of the trucks will be down and every truck will still sell. Give away, give away, not sell. Be giving away different kinds of food and we'll have our meal out there and then we'll come back in and have service that afternoon. We're looking for a very special time and I hope you'll be there for that. Sun Thursday night we'll have a uh, goer sender meeting and uh, I don't think I told Dan this, but it looks like we've got a, a, a Iranian Christian that got saved in Australia and the pastors a church of ex-Muslims or the 150 strong that will be speaking in, uh, on a, Thursday night, a Sunday night here pretty soon. So you can pray for Australia and pray for that. It's all being worked out right now. Thank you very much. You're dismissed. God bless you.